Unity of Good by Mary Baker Eddy. Caution in the Truth. Perhaps no doctrine of Christian science rouses so much natural doubt and questioning as this that God knows no such thing as sin. Indeed, this may be set down as one of the things hard to be understood, such as the Apostle Peter declared were taught by his fellow Apostle Paul, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest unto their own destruction. Let us then reason together on this important subject, whose statement in Christian science may justly be characterized as wonderful. Does God know or behold sin, sickness, and death? The nature and character of God is so little apprehended and demonstrated by mortals that I counsel my students to defer this infinite inquiry in their discussions of Christian science. In fact, they had better leave the subject untouched until they draw nearer to the divine character and are practically able to testify by their lives that as they come closer to the true understanding of God, they lose all sense of error. The scriptures declare that God is too pure to behold iniquity. Habakkuk. But they also declare that God pitieth them who fear him, that there is no place where his voice is not heard, that he is a very present help in trouble. The sinner has no refuge from sin except in God, who is his salvation. We must, however, realize God's presence, power, and love in order to be saved from sin. This realization takes away man's fondness for sin and his pleasure in it. And lastly, It removes the pain which accrues to him from it. Then follows this, as the finale in science. The sinner loses his sense of sin and gains a higher sense of God, in whom there is no sin. The true man, really saved, is ready to testify of God in the infinite penetration of truth and can affirm that the mind which is good, or God, has no knowledge of sin. In the same manner, the sick lose their sense of sickness and gain that spiritual sense of harmony which contains neither discord nor disease. According to this same rule, in divine science, the dying, if they die in the Lord, awake from a sense of death to a sense of life in Christ, with a knowledge of truth and love beyond what they possessed before, because Their lives have grown so far toward the stature of manhood in Christ Jesus that they are ready for a spiritual transfiguration through their affections and understanding. Those who reach this transition called death without having rightly improved the lessons of this primary school of mortal existence and still believe in matter's reality, pleasure, and pain, are not ready to understand immortality. Hence, they awake only to another sphere of experience and must pass through another probationary state 
before it can be truly said of them, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. They upon whom the second death, of which we read in the Apocalypse, Revelation 20, hath no power, are those who have obeyed God's commands and have washed their robes white through the sufferings of the flesh and the triumphs of spirit. Thus they have reached the goal in divine science by knowing him in whom they have believed. This knowledge is not the forbidden fruit of sin, sickness, and death, but it is the fruit which grows on the tree of life. This is the understanding of God, whereby man is found in the image and likeness of good, not of evil, of health, not of sickness, of life, not of death. God is all in all. Hence, he is in himself only, in his own nature and character, and is perfect being or consciousness. He is all the life and mind there is or can be. Within himself is every embodiment of life and mind. If he is all, he can have no consciousness of anything unlike himself, because if he is omnipresent, there can be nothing outside of himself. Now this self-same God is our helper. He pities us. He has mercy upon us and guides every event of our careers. He is near to them who adore him. To understand him without a single taint of our mortal, finite sense of sin, sickness, or death is to approach him and become like him. Truth is God, and in God's law. This law declares that truth is all, and there is no error. This law of truth destroys every phase of error. To gain a temporary consciousness of God's law is to feel, in a certain finite human sense, that God comes to us and pities us. But the attainment of the understanding of his presence through the science of God destroys our sense of imperfection or of his absence through a diviner sense that God is all true consciousness. And this convinces us that as we get still nearer him, we must forever lose our own consciousness of error. But how could we lose all consciousness of error if God be conscious of it? God has not forbidden man to know him. On the contrary, the Father bids man have the same mind which was also in Christ Jesus, which was certainly the divine mind. But God does forbid man's acquaintance with evil. Why? Because evil is no part of the divine knowledge. John's Gospel declares that life eternal consists in the knowledge of the only true God and of Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Surely, from such an understanding of science, such knowing the vision of sin is wholly excluded. 
Nevertheless, at the present crude hour, no wise men or women will rudely or prematurely agitate a theme involving the all of infinity. Rather, will they rejoice in the small understanding they have already gained of the wholeness of deity and work gradually and gently up toward the perfect thought divine. This meekness will increase their apprehension of God because their mental struggles and pride of opinion will proportionately diminish. Everyone should be encouraged not to accept any personal opinion on so great a matter, but to seek the divine science of this question of truth by following upward individual convictions, undisturbed by the frightened sense of any need of attempting to solve every life problem in a day. Great is the mystery of godliness, says Paul, and mystery involves the unknown. No stubborn purpose to force conclusions on this subject will unfold in us a higher sense of deity. Neither will it promote the cause of truth or enlighten the individual thought. Let us respect the rights of conscience and the liberty of the sons of God, so letting our moderation be known to all men. Let no enmity, no untempered controversy spring up between Christian science students and Christians who wholly or partially differ from them as to the nature of sin and the marvelous unity of man with God shadowed forth in scientific thought. Rather, let the stately goings of this wonderful part of truth be left to the supernal guidance. These are but parts of thy ways, says Job and the whole is greater than its parts. Our present understanding is but the seed within itself, for it is divine science bearing fruit after its kind. Sooner or later, the whole human race will learn that in proportion as the spotless selfhood of God is understood, human nature will be renovated, and man will receive a higher selfhood, derived from God, and the redemption of mortals from sin, sickness, and death be established on everlasting foundations. The science of physical harmony, as now presented to the people in divine light, is radical enough to promote as forcible collisions of thought as the age has strength to bear. Until the heavenly law of health, according to Christian science, is firmly grounded, even the thinkers are not prepared to answer intelligently leading questions about God and sin. And the world is far from ready to assimilate such a grand and all-absorbing verity concerning the divine nature and character as is embraced in the theory of God's blindness to error and ignorance of sin. No wise mother, though a graduate of Wellesley College, will talk to her babe about the problems of Euclid. Not much more than a half century ago, the assertion of universal salvation provoked discussion and horror, similar to what our declarations about sin and deity must arouse, if hastily pushed to the front 
while the platoons of Christian science are not yet thoroughly drilled in the planar manual of their spiritual armament. Wait patiently on the Lord, and in less than another fifty years, his name will be magnified in the apprehension of this new subject, as already he is glorified in the wide extension of belief in the impartial grace of God, shown by the changes at Andover Seminary and in multitudes of other religious folds. Nevertheless, though I thus speak, and from my heart of hearts, it is due both to Christian science and myself to make also the following statement. When I have most clearly seen and most sensibly felt that the infinite recognizes no disease, this has not separated me from God but has so bound me to him as to enable me instantaneously to heal a cancer which had eaten its way to the jugular vein. In the same spiritual condition, I have been able to replace dislocated joints and raise the dying to instantaneous health. People are now living who can bear witness to these cures. Herein is my evidence from on high that the views here promulgated on this subject are correct. Certain self-proved propositions pour into my waiting thought in connection with these experiences, and here is one such conviction that an acknowledgment of the perfection of the infinite unseen confers a power nothing else can. An incontestable point in divine science is that because God is all, a realization of this fact dispels even the sense or consciousness of sin and brings us nearer to God bringing out the highest phenomena of the all-mind.